great pleasure that I introduce now our third speaker, Roy Boyd, uh, who um, is a professor of economics here at Ohio University. Uh, he received uh, his BA in economics from the University of New Mexico and an MA and PhD from Duke University. Uh, and his areas of specialty include uh, resource economics, international trade, and computable general equilibrium modeling. Maybe the econo economists in the room know what that means. I don't really. <laughs> Uh, now, he's come here today to talk to us about our, our relationship, economic and uh, relationship and human relationship with Mexico, and he's very well equipped to do that. He just published a book called Understanding the Mexican Economy, a Social, Cultural and Political Overview, and this book is an in, uh, innovative approach to the study of a national economy that has been and is today very relevant for the United States, and it's notable for taking its analysis beyond just economic principles and models, but for considering the place of culture, history, and social dynamics in this trajectory of current uh, realities of the Mexican economy. And those interested in taking a look at the book later on, the library has it as an e-book, uh, so it's easily accessible. And so please now join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Boyd. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mariana. I really appreciate that. Uh, I might also shamelessly add that it's also available on Amazon.com so, and would make a handsome addition to your home library and or coffee table. Okay, uh, with, that, with that said, I want to uh, first of all thank Professor Kim uh, uh, Mariana uh, as, and all the organizers of this conference. I would also like to thank the co-authors of this book who've written a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be presenting here today. Uh, that is uh, Maria Eugenia Ibararan and uh, uh, Roberto uh, Vélez Grajales. Uh, uh, Maria uh, uh, teaches at Ibero University in Pueblo, Mexico, and uh, Roberto uh, teaches, uh, he, he actually is employed by the uh, uh, Centro de Estudios uh, uh, Espinosa Iglesias in um, Mexico City. Um, and so, as I said, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be presenting uh, was obviously uh, their research and as well as the research of other people. Um, uh, there's, uh, uh, I, I use good research wherever I can. Um, now, um, so let's, uh, we've got quite a few things to, to, to go over uh, and let's uh, get going and see. Ah, there it is, there's the book, handsome volume. Now, um, what we're going to do, let me just give you an outline of how we're going to proceed. Uh, we're going to start out with the history of uh, Mexican migration from the 1800s until 2000. We're going to do a quick tour of what uh, was going on, both looking at Mexico, they're talking about the push and pull factors, both what was going on in Mexico and what was going on in the United States and what was going on between the two countries uh, over that long period of time. Uh, if we make that uh, sort of mock to quick overflight over that, we're then going to have a dramatic pause. Uh, and that's when we go and look at, again, uh, in, um, in connection with the theme of this week, we're looking at wealth and poverty. We're going to be looking at inequality in Mexico, and first of all, among classes, skewness of distribution of income, things of that nature. Then we're going to be looking at inequality in Mexico among regions. Okay, Most of this this talk is going to be about Mexico. We, we had the thing, the era of Trump, that was just to lure you folks in, you know, that was just fake news. Okay, mainly this is going to be about Mexico. Inequality in Mexico among regions, because there's a huge uh, regional disparity uh, among income there. And then inequality in Mexico when considering intergenerational social mobility. I'm going to look at how likely it is that people can move from poverty uh, into uh, of not even wealth, but into a better standard of living over generations. And then we're going to finally look at economic stagnation and informality in the Mexican economy. This is an aspect of not just the Mexican economy, but all Latin American economies um, that tend to uh, stifle um, uh, productivity and tend to exacerbate um, uh, problems with the distribution of income. Then we, after that dramatic pause, we go back to U.S.-Mexican migration issues in the 21st century and talk a little bit about economic theory here. I'm, I'm an economist. I've got to hit some economic theory sometime. And we'll definitely do it right there. Look a little at some modeling that I've done and then finally end with current policy alternatives for the U.S. and Mexico. 
Okay, uh, tall order of services, and hopefully we can get to all that uh, without too much trouble. So let's start out with the history of migration issues in Mexico in the early 1800s until 1920. Uh, Mexico's independence from Spain, uh, Spain uh, dates back to 1821. Uh, and it was a, you know, if you think about a divorce, it was not all that amicable a divorce, okay? The independence occurred in 1821, but there was still fighting with Spain going on for 10 years after that. And if you look at the history of Mexico for that 1800s, that entire period, uh, there was such trauma actually going on uh, in terms of wars, poverty, uh, disease, things of that nature, that Mexico at the end of that century was not all that much better than it was at the, at the beginning of that century. Um, now, much of Mexico's original territory was in what is now the United States. Okay? Uh, that's why you have places with names like San Antonio, Santa Fe, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and uh, San Francisco. They just didn't come out, pop out that way, okay? Those weren't Native American um, sorts of uh, words. Those are, those, are, uh, those are part of what was at one time New Spain and then became Mexico. Much of this uh, was lost in the war in Texas in 1836, the Alamo and all that. Uh, much, uh, then most of it really was lost in the Western holdings of the American, the Mexican-American War in 1848. And then the final portion was sold uh, kind of a fire sale because Mexico was uh, in a lot of financial difficulty and sold to the U.S. in what is now referred to as the Gadsden Purchase, named for the person who facilitated it, but it was actually purchased by the United States. So let's look at this. This is um, a, uh, a map that you might not see in your school system, but probably most folks in Mexico have seen, uh, school children have seen in theirs, okay? This right here, if we, I don't know if I could show this. This right here, all this area in the United States used to be what was recognized as territory of Mexico. This is the section of Texas. This is all this area that includes California, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico. And here's the Gadsden Purchase. Uh, that accounted for what was approximately 50% uh, of the area of Mexico. Okay. Uh, um, now, uh, I haven't put this up here uh, to give anyone a guilt complex or anything like that. But the reason that I put it up is to show that there's a, there were, has long been a Spanish-speaking population in this area of the country. And there are a lot of family connections, people in El Paso, which is over here, uh, people in uh, uh, Tijuana is over here. The, there have been a lot of back and forth here uh, over the past several hundred years. And so the people that we're talking about as immigrants actually have Quite, quite a history uh, in this, this region, okay. So, let's go on. Uh, now, this is Mexico in the latter part of the 1800s. By the way, those were, a lot of people were lost in those wars. Um, there was another war that came up, it was called the War of Reform. Um, and this was uh, uh, essentially between um, liberal and conservative elements in Mexico. That was won by the forces of Benito Juarez, who you might have heard of. Uh, and then, if that wasn't enough, in the 1860s, when the American, U, the U.S. was involved in the Civil War, um, uh, Mexico was invaded by France. Okay, Napoleon III uh, decided to take advantage of the, the situation in the United States and set up a puppet uh, government run by Maximilian Habsburg, and that's right, Habsburg of the Habsburgs in Austria, and he uh, thought he was going to be Greeted as a liberator, not so much. He was deposed in 1866 and then executed. Uh, Juarez then continued as president until his death in 1872. Uh, much of the 1800s then were filled with wars and the economy grew very little uh, throughout uh, the century, okay, as I've said before. But something happened, and this is a person that if you listen to the, the president, the present present president of Mexico, um, Andres uh, Manuel Lopez Obrador, he will talk about a number of figures in Mexican history, but the next one he doesn't talk about at all. 
Uh, but he, uh, I like to talk about this guy because he is one of the most important figures actually in Mexico. Uh, because he governed for, for 30 years between 1876 uh, until 1911. His name was uh, Porfirio Diaz, and he dominated the, the, the politics of Mexico. And in, as a matter of fact, this entire period in the latter part of the 1800s is known as a Porfiriado. And this really sets the stage for this inequality of income that we're talking about right now. Okay? And here he is, okay, looking like the late 19th century autocrat that he was, okay, kind of like Kaiser Wilhelm or Tsar Nicholas or something like that with all the medals and everything. Porfirio Diaz, he, uh, I don't know if you can see it here, uh, he had many uh, famous sayings, but this is one thing that he was uh, um, very um, uh, fond of saying is that he wasn't a, an ideologue at all. He said, little politics and plenty of management, okay. Uh, now, he le this led to a time of growth, stability, and foreign investment. There was a lot of investment in the mining sector, a lot of investment in the railroads, a lot of investment in the northern part of the country, and this is going to become very important. Um, income distribution, because of this foreign investment, income distribution remained highly skewed, even though there was economic development there. Uh, indeed, the railroads, very few railroads have been built since Diaz's time. But the income distribution remained highly skewed, okay? And uh, this is going to carry over into the 20, 20th century and the 21st century. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing that uh, economic historians uh, do. I'm not an economic historian, but my friend Roberto is, and this is some of the, uh, the uh, research that he does. because. GDP, things that we, we uh, talk about, you think of as being um, things that uh, uh, give economic welfare, or indicators of what economic welfare, they're rather modern, okay? And if you want to go back in time and look and see how well people are doing, there's not um, that much. So economic historians, being the clever people that they are, uh, find some data that they can use. And one type of data that is used is looking at people's mean heights. Because we do have, and this is, by the way, uh, this is in uh, uh, centimeters. This is not in inches or anything like that. The, we're not talking about giants here. Um, but these, um, look at people's mean heights because that, uh, especially at the ages three to four, that shows the kind of nutrition people are getting. And so if you lag that uh, to 1920 when these people are actually going into the military and that's where these mean heights are taken from, male population in the military, you can get an idea of how the welfare was going. Now if you look here, this here we are in the horizontal axis, you've got the, um, the, the years and then you've got the height on the vertical axis. Uh, you can see that things were going down and then around the 1900s, right towards the end, the last 10 years of Diaz's uh, rule, we see um, an increase in height. Actually, it shows an increase in welfare. And then there was a huge dip. That came for a very specific reason. That's when the Mexican Revolution occurred. And that was, uh, that was bad. Then what you see, there was, that was followed by some more wars. And, you, but, and it wasn't until the 1930s and 40s that you start seeing that mean height raise again. So let's look at this, okay? I mean, look at what was going on. As I say, mean heights are a very good indicator of nutrition during a person's early years. Now, the average height decreases in the late 1800s. And remember that average height wasn't all that high in the 1800s to begin with. Then it goes up at the turn of the century and corresponds to the last years of Diaz's rule. But then it goes down drastically during the period of the Mexican Revolution, which is roughly from 1910 to 1920. That was a horrible time, okay? Uh, at least 1.5 million people um, uh, died during that time. Uh, half, after that, half a million people immigrated to the United States. That's where we're getting into immigration to the United States. And the population during that time shrank by 5.4%. This was followed by another war, because what the revolution did is it took a lot of, it limited the power of uh, the Catholic Church. Well, 
there were people that weren't happy about that. These people were known as the Cristeros, a lot of uh, whom lived in uh, w the western part of Mexico, and there was further uh, bloodshed that occurred during that time. So the 1920s, um, it wasn't until the 1930s that things really stabilized, okay? And you see that in those mean heights. Okay, now let's look at Mexican-U.S. migration over that time. During the latter part of the 1800s, the U.S. was coming out of it, its civil war, and this was a time of the great western expansion, okay? And there was actually little migration from Mexico at this time. Okay, we're going back into the 1800s here. The border region was rather porous, with workers migrating back and forth seasonally in response to uh, agricultural activity. Okay, you would see uh, people with their cattle herds uh, going back and forth against uh, the border. I was uh, several years ago in the uh, Big Bend country, very beautiful country in uh, uh, southern Texas. Uh, people would uh, take their cattle back and forth, okay? Families would uh, freely migrate back and forth over the border. During this period, most of the immigration to the U.S. was originating in Europe, and I would guess that a large, substantial portion of you folks' um, ancestry might come from that great immigra uh, immigration at that time. I know that's where my grand when my grandparents, uh, great grandparents, uh, my grandparents and great grandparents came from uh, what you know, England, Ireland, Central Europe, that time. Um, so this changed during the period. Uh, of the revolution, and upwards to 500,000 people migrated from Mexico in response to the violence and economic hardship. Okay, sounds familiar. This trend continued into the 1920s until the situation stabilized in Mexico. Then what we're going to see, talking about push and pull, we're going to see some, some pushing back here. And this occurred, this was the roaring 20s when they were coming in, but the depression occurred at that time, in the 1930s. The Depression saw massive layoffs in the U.S. And as a consequence of this, hundreds of thousands of Mexicans are living, uh, living in the U.S. were deported at that time. Okay? You had mass deportations coming in, and there was really no let up in this, and then suddenly something happened in 1941. Okay? The U.S. was attacked. And uh, the early 1940s, then there was an easing of immigration restrictions following the drafting of a large number of able-bodied males to join the war effort. You needed people to go in the fields. You needed people to gather the crops. You needed people in manufacturing. And so this led to something was called the Bracero program. Okay, Bracero, Spanish meaning labor worker. And the purpose of that was, and this is from the, legisl the, the legislation itself, to provide the U.S. with short-term temporary migrant workers to offset labor shortages. Okay. Uh, and this program continued until the mid-1960s. The Bracero program was with us until the mid-1960s. In Mexico, uh, the domestic situation began to stabilize in the 1930s with the implementation of immunization programs, and then we had public education, new industrialization. So things were getting better in Mexico over this time. Uh, the long period of sustained growth ended, however, and gave way to uh, what you had was a big oil. There was a, a new oil, uh, uh, oil reserves found off the coast of Tabasco uh, in a place called Cantarel. And uh, that led to a lot of money, which was probably not spent very well by the uh, Mexican government. Uh, and you had a boom, and then you had a bust. And um, so you had some economic instability uh, then in the 70s and 80s. The wage differential between the United States and Mexico hovered at around 10 to 1 over that time. That's one reason for some push-pull factors. And what you then saw was about 200,000 immigrants crossing the border on the U.S. on average every year during that period era of mass immigration. And this led to the U.S. Immigration Reform and Control Act called IRCA. And under this act, which was signed by Ronald Reagan in 1986, 2.6 million migrants were regularized. Side effect of this, migration changed from what we call circular to a permanent settlement. Okay, people said, hey, 
we might get an amnesty and it's getting more difficult to come here instead of going back and forth. Let's just stay here. And people started living more in the, sh in the shadows, as it were. Okay. 1990s, uh, the growth in Mexico remained sluggish in spite of NAFTA, which one of the reasons for NAFTA was to have people working on the Mexican side of the border rather than the U.S. side of the border. In 1994-95, there was a short-lived economic crisis in Mexico that was resolved, in a large part, actually, to uh, efforts on the part of the United States, Canada, and the IMF. And they were very successful. And uh, President Cedillo, who was the president of Mexico at that time, uh, implemented austerity measures, and that crisis was abetted in several years. So it was, not, it was a very short-lived crisis. Um, and for reasons quite separate from immigration and NAFTA, the 1990s also saw an increase in the entry of illegal drugs from Mexico into the U.S. That was actually precipitated, interestingly enough, one of the things that precipitated was the uh, lack of civil wars or the dying down of civil wars in Central America. The U.S. economy remained strong and migrants continued to stream into the U.S. from Mexico. Okay. Now, this is where the dramatic pause occurs. Okay, let's talk about inequality in Mexico. First of all, let's look at inequality among classes. The distribution of wealth and income in Mexico is very, fairly, fairly skewed. I would say very skewed. Uh, the Gini coefficient, where you might have heard of before, which is a measure really of inequality, in Mexico stands at around 0.5, where zero is perfect equality and one is perfect inequality. Uh, zero is, you know, uh, where everyone's equal uh, and we're all the same. And one is where one person has uh, everything. And Mexico is right in between. But <laughs> uh, by comparison, uh, always good to have a comment on the Gini, on the Gini coefficient. Uh, by comparison, the Gini coefficient in the U.S. is around uh, 0.41. The level of poverty in Mexico, where, and then we're talking about what's called labor poverty, this is extreme poverty, is about 20%. And it has not budged from that for the last 30 years. That's not to say that the poverty level in Mexico is around 20%, what we would call poverty in this country. That level is around 50%. We're talking about food poverty, people living for essentially uh, from one paycheck to the next from hand to mouth. Okay, and there remains a significant gap between the top and lowest income deciles. Here is the uh, evolution of extreme food poverty uh, in Mexico. And you can see, interestingly enough, where that crisis occurred. I was talking about the sometimes called the peso crisis. Uh, it, was, it corresponded when, it was, when Cedillo actually took over. There happened to be a lot of uh, um, spending by his predecessor, uh, President Salinas, uh, right in the end of his term, and that led to a devaluation uh, and 100% inflation. You had a crisis here, but as I said, the austerity measures that were taken uh, really alleviated this crisis. And then what you find is this right here. You find in uh, ah, the latter part of this period, uh, fairly steady. And that's, that's, that's very concerning because things are not getting better that way. And you can see this from the next thing here. This is a very telling sort of uh, graph. This is current how, uh, average household income by deciles. Decile is by tenths. Where decile one, you see right here, that is the, uh, those are the richest folks. This, by the way, are in pesos. These are not dollars. Even though that, the one problem is, uh, Pesos and dollars had the same symbol. Um, so don't be fooled. These are pesos. So divide everything by about 10. That's what you're seeing, OK, you, to get to dollars. Actually, not quite by 10, uh, because uh, money goes a little further in Mexico. Yeah, purchasing power parity. But um, the decile, you can see the top decile is way above decile number two, OK? Uh, I mean, decile one is the lowest, I'm sorry. You can see it's very, uh, the top decile, decile 10, is way above decile 9. Okay? The top 10th are making a lot more than even the next 10th. And you can see these people right here on the bottom, this bottom 20% really scrunched together. 
even to the top 50%, we're still talking poverty level right here. It's not until you get above, uh, above this where we're actually talking people that are having what you might consider uh, middle class sorts of things, but really have a distribution. And it's even more skewed than that. One of the, for example, one of the richest people in the world, Carlos Slim, a multi-billionaire, uh, lives in Mexico. And there are a number of quite rich people that live there. Okay. So it, it's a fairly skewed distribution. Okay, so what we've talked about then is we have an income in Mexico. This is, again, connect this to migration. We have a skewed, uh, a skewed uh, distribution of income by class. We also have a skewed uh, distribution by region, okay? Inequality in Mexico among regions. This is Mexico, and here we have the north of Mexico. Uh, I would say, has anyone been? I'm sure a lot of people have been to Mexico, right? Okay. A lot of you might have been in this region right here, right? Yucatan, Cancun, okay, that's right, yeah. Okay, this region maybe not so much, okay? Uh, this is uh, the region in the north, of the states of uh, Chihuahua, uh, uh, Coahuila, uh, Nuevo Leon, where, uh, where we have Monterrey. Here we have Baja California, this is where Tijuana is up here. This is a fairly arid region, but it's a fairly prosperous region. This is where a lot of Diaz um, mines happen to be. This is where a lot of the railroads were built, and this is where the border of the United States is. And a lot of trade, a lot of, uh, after NAFTA was enacted, a lot of the uh, light manufacturing companies, the maquiladoras, are located in uh, Ciudad Juarez over here, or in uh, Tijuana, or, or in Nuevo Laredo, in, in this, uh, this area around in here. So you actually have a fairly uh, nice area. Right here is the center of Mexico. This is uh, uh, Mexico City and the state of Mexico. Um, again, a lot of people live there. A lot of people live there. You, in the city of Mexico, uh, small as it is, you have more than the population of Canada. Okay, everybody packed together, uh, loving each other. Okay, and here, here is the state of Mexico. Over here is uh, Puebla. This area right here. This in the this region over here is the state of Jalisco, where you have uh, Guadalajara, um, and uh, a fairly prosperous region in Mexico. Uh, this is technically, uh, if you have tequila, that's where tequila comes from. Okay, uh, uh, and this of course is the Yucatan. Okay, <laughs> where a lot of you students probably have drunk some of that tequila. Okay, and in this region right in here. Um, this is the southern part of the country. This is the poorest part of the country. This region was completely ignored uh, by the Spanish, uh, by Diaz. Uh, this, these are the states of uh, Oaxaca, um, Guerrero, and Chiapas. Um, Tabasco is right here. Um, and these are, are the poorest states, okay? Um, and for uh, some reasons that we're going to go into, but there is a definite difference among regions. Okay, uh, in general, since the time of the Spaniards, the northern and central regions have been more prosperous in the south. Historically, these reasons have centered, as I said, on mining and trade with the other countries. This became more pronounced during the time of Diaz, uh, and more investment was directed to railroads in the north and central regions. Agriculture, infrastructure, and educational policies have continued to favor these regions to this day, as have NAFTA. As I said, the maquiladoras are there. That's where um, the uh, infrastructure, a lot of the subsidies to agriculture occur in the north. Uh, the south has been pretty much uh, ignored. Um, and there's been analysis by Esquivel, Quintana, and Ruiz. Um, all of these studies have looked at what they call convergence, economic convergence over time. It, uh, there's economic theory that regions or countries should converge in their income. And they, f they, they look at these convergence models and they find that things seem to be converging until you hit the 1980s. And there's this stagnation that just never seems to want to go away. Okay, we'll get back to that in just a second. Okay, now. This is another reason, current rail and road infrastructures. I said the rail really hasn't changed that much since the time of Diaz. Look at the south. Rails don't even come here. Um, 
And if you look at these roads, some of these roads have not even been built until recently. Uh, in most, if you want to go from the south to even a port or something like that, you really have to go through Mexico City. This, uh, this uh, hub and spoke type of uh, um, thing is, is sort of forced the, the south to be essentially cut off from uh, the, the trade benefits that a lot of the north and the central parts of the country get, uh, as well as uh, the, the Gulf Coast. Okay, so now let's talk, now that's regional, we talked about class, now let's talk inequality in intergenerational social mobility. Okay, uh, and let's look at relative social mobility over two generations. Um, now, um, uh, let's see, uh, I think his name, uh, Roberto Rafael, I believe uh, Roberto's his first name, Rafael at uh, CEEY in 2014, uh, talks about um, something called a social building. Okay, instead of deciles, let's have quintiles. And let's have a uh, building which has five floors. And each floor corresponds to an income quintile. If you live on the first floor, you're in the, the bottom 20%. If you're in the next floor, you're in the next 20%. The top floor, the penthouse, as it were, you're in the top two deciles. And um, so Raphael, in his work, talks about a social building. And imagine an elevator there. In one generation, you get on that elevator, you're on the first floor. Are you going to get off on the second floor? Are you going to get off on the third floor? Are you going to get off on the fourth floor? Where are you going to get off? Or if you get up on the fifth floor, if you're lucky enough, mm, are, uh, what's going to happen? Okay, in Mexico today, and this is uh, uh, my, my colleague Roberto has done a lot of this work, Mexico today, 48 out of 100 people born in the lowest quintile, the first floor, remain there. That's it, their entire life, okay? Only 22 manage to get to the second floor. And those uh, in the highest quintiles tend to stay there, okay? That's, that's a good thing, they tend to stay there. But on the, the, there is a lot of stagnation there. Um, this is less than in adaptive countries. And what you find is one's family background, one's family connections, uh, one's family wealth um, is the best determinant of social strata, and the major source of an investment for a person. A person the schools that a person goes to, the amount of human capital that they can get are, are a lot of times just determined by where they're born and they stay there. Uh, okay, here, here we can see this. You look at, you're born in the uh, floor one. Your chances of getting floor two, 22%. Chances of getting floor three, 14%. And some people win the lottery. Or you become a very good soccer player, something like that. You get up to uh, 4%. Uh, likewise, if you're, it's just the opposite. If you're born in the highest quintile, you're going to stay there, you know, unless, you know, you're, uh, you go into a life of drugs or something like that, you're, you're going to tend to stay there. Now, the question is, how does that compare with developed countries? Very good question. The U.S. actually isn't all that much better. Okay, <laughs> strange as it sounds, uh, well, not that strange as it sounds, 42% uh, uh, only 8% uh, only of people that are born in the first floor get to the top floor. Interestingly enough, that's not really representative of most developed countries. Most are more like the U.K., where 30%, only 30% remain in that uh, bottom quintile. A full 12% go to the top, which is kind of interesting because we think of Britain as being a very class uh, you know, the queen and all that, class conscious country. Actually, the UK has more social mobility than the United States does. Okay, now what about it statewide? Okay, if, one, if we have social mobility I among states, if you're born in the lowest quintile, where would you actually stay there the longest? Okay, let's look at it by state, and it won't be a surprise, I guarantee it. Worst state to be, okay, if the national level is one where you, your biggest chance of remaining on that bottom quintile right here, well, it's not here on, on this thing, but it's Oaxaca, followed by Chiapas and Guerrero. Those are the um, 
the, the states where we have absolutely the, the least mobility. Education, opportunities, whatever there. The highest is actually in uh, Jalisco. That's where Guadalajara is. And also the federal district, which is Mexico City, has a, a fairly high uh, social mo mo mobility. Um, and also it's not on there. Uh, I don't know why it's not on, on there, but uh, on the, the picture. But I can tell you that others that are on there are uh, um, Baja California by Tijuana. Um, and also, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, uh, Let's see, another northern state, I believe it's uh, either Chihuahua or, or Nuevo Leon, where, yeah, Nuevo Leon, where uh, Monterrey is. Okay, so you can see uh, this, this poverty. Okay, now, the final thing that I want to say about this is like many developing countries, Mexico has a large, what we call, informal sector. Workers uh, get paid without benefit of a formal agreement or regular schedule. Uh, this can probably be in, uh, institutional in na uh, nature. Uh, two researchers, Asa Moglu and Robinson, talked about Mexico as having what's called an uh, exploita uh, exploitative type of culture where, um, where um, one's um, social position is, uh, uh, where entrepreneurship is not really uh, valued, where uh, one's uh, property rights are not really respected, and uh, um, one's access to illegal institutions really varies by uh, what social strata you're in. Um, so this tends to throw a lot of businesses into an underground economy or um, informal structure. Uh, there are no labor regulations in this informal economy. No social insurance is paid here. Uh, workers get their pay without the benefit of a formal agreement, obviously, or regular schedule. A paycheck at a, uh, to a, at a time. The relative percentage in the informal st structure varies widely by industry. 72% of all people are in this informal structure. What do these informal industries look like? Here's a picture uh, taken in Puebla. There's your plumber. Okay. There's your electrician. Okay. They're very, very informal. They have no formal contract. They have no benefits. These people um, and with this, there are a lot of problems of having this kind of, of industry. And you can see that it's very high in uh, manufacturing, very high in services. Most of the industries are this informal industry. What does an informal industry mean? It means we have small firms, little social insurance, low productivity. And why is there low productivity? Because they can't take advantage of scale economies. They're small. They can't get loans. They can't vertically integrate. They don't have distribution systems. And people that are really highly educated really have no future in a country like this. Why? I mean, I'm, that's, being high, that's hyperbole, but they don't have a future in industries like this. Because uh, um, uh, if you're an IT person, if you're an accountant, you're not going to get a job with, uh, a, in a, a small Company like they don't have need for someone if they're only going from one paycheck at a time. They have no formal labor contracts. Okay, so education there's the there's becomes very much of a dead end. Okay, and this increases the incentives to migrate. Um, fiscal for, uh, reform. One thing that we've looked at is perhaps changing the the tax structure to have less of, a, uh, of the taxes and labor taxes to possibly get more firms into the formal se uh, sector. Okay, now, let's go back. There's the dramatic pause. The dramatic pause is over. Let's talk to U.S. migration issues in the 21st century. First of all, George W. Bush had big plans for a comprehensive immigration deal, but that was sidelined by 9-11. Uh, security uh, concerns were become paramount, and so that didn't go through. Obama reforms met a very similar fate in Congress. Uh, at least Obama's got through, um, they got through the Senate, and then they died in the House. Uh, then what happened was that the recession hit in 2008, and the number of undocumented workers was down to 5.9 million. This is one of those facts that people don't realize. There was one million less 
Mexicans, undocumented workers in the U.S. in 2012 than there was in 2008. Um, and interestingly enough, um, uh, the Obama uh, administration established the Deferred Action for Children Over Rivals program. We'll talk about that a little later. That has been talked about before DACA, which has been in the news quite a bit. Um, deportations increased under Obama. Um, and I think Obama still holds the one-month record for deportations. I know that Trump was trying to, to beat him out or something like that. There was even memo sent on that. But um, deportations, the, the largest actually was um, under Obama, in spite of the fact that uh, the number of people uh, that were self-deporting, as Mitt Romney would say, actually increased over this region here. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, led by Trump and others, the fight against leniency and tougher security intensified. Now let's talk a little bit about economics. Okay? Uh, since I'm an economist, I've got to do that. Um, and here is a very simple supply and demand graph for labor, where we've got wage on the, on the vertical axis, employment on the horizontal axis. Now you note that in the absence of um, migration, immigration, uh, you're going to have um, your equilibrium here at point A with a wage of W1 and an employment of E1. There's no migration. Now let's say that there's migration. What that does is it pushes the supply of labor out. That lowers the wage rate and it, uh, some of the people that are employed, this, um, the total employment is E2, but this amount here, E3 to E2, these are all, this is all, uh, these jobs are taken by migrants. And this right here is native born. Notice there is not a one for one pushing out of the migrants. If there was no immigration at all, your employment would not go down to E3. It would only go back to E1. There is not a one for one uh, pushing out. Okay, but these are, these are the labor, this is, and this is for a particular type of labor we're talking uh, in this country, generally, this is where a lot of the friction happens in unskilled labor. Okay, so um, this is uh, this is a situation. Now, this can vary from market to market. It's kind of interesting. Okay, let's look at another diagram. Same diagram with a different slope, or as we economists like to say, elasticity. Okay, and what you find here is with a um, um, more elastic demand, you have less. Uh, displacement and less of a wage impact. Okay. So, so this can vary from market to market. Okay. Now, let's look then at the economic costs of immigration. Okay. There's an influx of largely unskilled immigrants. There will be a downward pressure on wages and a displacement of native born workers. The displacement, however, will not be one for one and can vary significantly across markets and regions. There is no consensus in the literature. You know, so, okay, what do you economists say? There's no consensus in the literature on these effects. Uh, Borges, for example, finds wage effects of 9%. Uh, others like Ottavio and Perry find wage effects which are less than 1%, and Card and DiNardo find wage effects that are between 1% and 3%. But they're all good researchers. I don't think anyone's biased here. They could all just be looking at different markets because different markets have different elasticities, different, different slopes, okay? So there's, there's no, um, um, so the jury is essentially out on this. Again, we're talking about unskilled labor here. New immigrants also cause extra government outlays because immigrants use public goods and services such as education, medical care, and public assistance. Uh, this is usually largest for first generation families. Those are the costs of immigration, but let's look at the benefits of immigration. Okay? The influx of immigrants increases the profits of the firm that employ them and acts as an incentive to increase production and establish new firms. Okay? Uh, hey, employers work out. Okay? I mean, things, things look good for employers. They're getting uh, a fairly inexpensive labor and they are doing, doing better. U.S. consumers also benefit since they are receiving goods and services at lower prices. Okay, you get lower price goods. Okay, you go to your motel and the hospitality staff might, might be uh, 
uh, undocumented and you might pay a lower ho hotel or motel bill. Okay, U.S. workers who are skilled also find employment opportunities since they have skills which are complementary to the immigrants. People who are, let's say, IT specialists or accountants or people that are working in the higher regions, uh, uh, echelons of that company actually find more employment and more wages because they have skills that are complementary. U.S. firms also benefit from increased demand for their products since new immigrants demand products of their own. I mean, sometimes I'll look at the, the news on Univision and what, because it's kind of good to watch the commercials and see what uh, people are, are demanding. And it's uh, Dish Latino is a big thing, okay? Uh, um, you get, uh, get your television programs, apps for your cell phones, um, um, creams to get rid of your wrinkles and stuff like that. Okay, all of those, all of those U.S. companies are selling to these um, immigrant foreign-born workers, and that is increasing GDP. Uh, Smith and Edmondson find that the government budget impact of migrants becomes positive in the second generation because more skill, uh, because people become more skilled and productive. Interestingly enough, among, if you're going to look at native-born versus immigrant populations, going from that first floor to that second floor, okay, if we go from the first floor to the second floor, Okay, from the first quintile to the second quintile, they, there is a higher jump among the children of immigrants than there is among the children of native born. Okay, that's just a fact. Immigrants go up and the second generation is paying back into the government coffers some of the, the material that was taken out from the first generation. Okay, now, other important takeaways. Immigrants have less unemployment than the native born, so on a per capita basis, they have less need for government assistance programs. Okay. Immigrants, and this is an interesting one here, immigrants have a lower incarceration rate than the native born, and this one, interestingly enough, is from the Cato Institute. Okay. Uh, is about half, half the incarceration uh, rate uh, or crime rate among uh, immigrants as opposed to native born, and it's very simple. If you are having you know, not really wanting the authorities to see you anyway, they're committing another crime is not a very smart thing to do. Getting yourself uh, uh, drunk and getting picked up or something like that, that's not a good idea. Okay, so you have less than that. And violent crimes as well. Immigrants have higher compliance in paying their taxes and, of course, hardly ever pay for tax refunds. Okay, for the same reason. Uh, now, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA program, was specially designed allow young adults to obtain education and advanced job skills. There's about 600, over 600,000 people who are eligible for it. Since they'll be working in high-skilled jobs, not low-skilled, it was crafted not to take jobs away from unskilled native-born workers. Since there'll be training to be productive members of society, they will also be net contributors to the public treasury. Thus, from an economic standpoint, a very strong case can be made for DACA. People can have arguments against DACA, but arguments against DACA from an economic standpoint are really don't have a leg to stand on. Okay. Now, running. Now, the last thing I'm going to do is just run my little model here. This is a model that I had, uh, an economy-wide model which looks at all the sectors in the economy. It's called a general equilibrium model, and we run it dynamically over 30 years looking under two scenarios. One scenario where we have migration at the present rate from Mexico in the industries that typically migrants go into, and another where we, we cut that off and we compare the two. Okay, and we run the model, assuming immigration will continue at historic trends over the period from 2020 to 2034, the models run out to 2036. Uh, then we look at the differences in GDP, investment, and welfare as before. What we're trying to do is take account of all the effects in the economy. Those demand effects that we talked about, uh, the, uh, co the uh, uh, people who have complementary labor skills, we want to take care of all of that in, in uh, the model. And also those, uh, the fact that you know, people are going to be demanding products in the U.S. that are migrants demanding U.S.-made products. And looking at what business owners get as well. 
So we, uh, we look at the business as usual case and we find when we look at GDP, when we look at economic welfare, when migration comes in, there is a net positive effect even netting out the increase to the population. There should be, unless everyone's a freeloader, there should be a positive effect. And I'm also just checking to see it's on the same order. But there's actually a net increase to that. It turns out that um, migrants tend to increase investment, in the supply of investment over time. So what you see is investment, which is the, the pink one here, or the, the lighter one, is soaring up because a lot of migrants are actually working in construction, manufacturing, the kinds of jobs that, that actually generate investment, buildings, things of that nature, and increase the capital stock so it starts going up. And like a horse drawing a cart, this investment is drawing up over time GDP. And so if we look, this is the, the difference in GDP between the no uh, investment case and the in, I mean, the, the no immigration case, or no migration case, and the migration case, and you can see that it increases uh, dramatically, okay? Not dramatically, these are rather small because the amount of migration is not that, that big a portion of the population, but over time it goes up, and if we look at the, uh, the welfare of individuals, we see that that tends to increase. Now, one caveat here, obviously, is that people in that lowest, agent one, which that's the lowest quintile, the people who are the, in that floor number one do not benefit the most. They benefit the least, okay? And that's what we would expect. These are people who are unskilled, uh, largely unskilled, are not capital owners. The capitalists who come in agent four and five, these people tend to, tend to be the biggest beneficiaries of that. Okay, so, uh, so what about the steps to implement a more workable migration policy, immigration policy? Uh, from the Mexican side, there are two things, three things, two by Alba. He has several suggestions. Rather than turning a blind eye to undocumented migration, the Mexican government should sponsor programs such as job placement and language training to facilitate the safe and orderly immigration process, okay? Mexican government should not um, lend, lend a blind, have, turn a blind eye. Uh, uh, and as a matter of fact, until Vincente Fox, no Mexican president actually admitted there was some sort of an immigration problem that Mexico had. It should moderate its, and it should also moderate its own rather draconian immigration policies with regards to refugees from Central America. Some of this is, I, I think, is taking place right now in Mexico with the new president. Furthermore, one thing that I would add, my colleagues and I would add, that institutional and fiscal for reform needs to, to uh, uh, deal with informality and increase productivity. Mexico has to increase the productivity of its own economy. From the U.S. side, um, several suggestions. Don't rely strictly on policies that concentrate exclusively on policing, border walls, such things. Such policies have never been effective or economically efficient and they breed resentment. Second, you can utilize and expand NAFTA's TN program. That allows a three-year specialty visas to be issued to citizens of the three NAFTA countries. And um, this could be expanded. Right now, it's for people who, have, uh, who are skilled. This could be expanded if you have sort of some job needs uh, for unskilled workers uh, when supply and demand situations warrant. And this, of course, can be combined with fast and accurate verification checks. Final point. Uh, cooperation and awareness of basic economic forces would lead to higher levels of development, growth, and economic welfare for both countries. The same applies to international trade policy and policies designed to stem the traffic of narcotics. Okay. That's it. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, Yes. Roy, you had mentioned that, that the Pinot program, and forgive me for not being an expert in this area, but could you say a bit more about that or maybe research and how that research maybe applies to current discussions that we're facing? Yeah, it, it turns out the Bracero program is, uh, was a very, very successful program uh, going from the 40s to the 60s. They found that hardly any of that labor was displaced. This is in an agricultural program. They found that when the Bracero program actually was removed, 
that rather than hiring native-born workers, most of the people uh, of the uh, uh, businesses there, this is in an, uh, a recent article in the American Economic Review, most of the people, uh, the uh, workers actually made technical change uh, and increased their capital uh, uh, instead of hiring new uh, native-born workers. Okay. Well, thank you very much.